Well, good evening. Hope you've had a good day today. Uh, we're going to uh, to continue our study through the book of Genesis on uh, Sunday night and Wednesday night. We have come from creation uh, through Noah, his family, through Abraham, now into his family, as we um, look at the family of Isaac. Um, we saw him last week, and we're going to continue to uh, to look at his life tonight. Unfortunately, not in such a good way. One of the reasons that I believe the Bible is true is because of what it doesn't leave out. If I was uh, if I was making a book that I could try to prove a point. I would have left out some of the stuff that's in the Bible, especially some of the things that are not too um, flattering. Uh, and certainly this chapter is not flattering about the uh, the life of uh, Isaac and his family. In fact, I've entitled the message tonight, A, a Dysfunctional Family, um, one that doesn't work as it's um, supposed to. If you remembered, we studied last time in Genesis chapter 26 about Isaac and how he continued in faith. And even though others pushed against him, the Philistines and um, the king, he was able to, he did fail in some ways, but he was able to keep doing what God had called him to do. He, as you remember, we talked about, he kept digging the wells, he kept moving, he kept uh, pursuing God, and because of that, God blessed him. Um, we also found out that Isaac, uh, his oldest son Esau, had married two of the women from Canaan, and they were a burden and a hurt to his family. And so we come, really, chapter 26 is the only chapter that deals with Isaac sort of by himself, and then we get to chapter 27, and we see basically um, the death of Isaac um, when he is uh, getting older, uh, anyway, we'll say. Um, let's look, if you have your Bibles, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you, but if you have your Bibles, look at Genesis chapter 27, and I'll just read about the first five verses to give us uh, sort of the, the start of the chapter, and then we'll go from there. It came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I'm old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard what Isaac spake to Esau his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Isaac, for the examples that we see in him, the pictures of Christ that we see. Lord, we're even grateful for the examples or the warnings maybe that we see in him that we would not do some of the things that they did. Help us, Lord, to trust you more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this family started out so well. How did we get to this point? They started well but they didn't finish well. They started out with Abraham sending his servants, you remember, to get a bride for his son. The servant went and prayed and asked the God of Abraham that he would guide him, that he would be able to pick the right person. And if you've been studying along with us, you remember how God directed him and uh, Rebecca came out, and she was this 
beautiful girl and um, the servant told her about Isaac and about Isaac's father and the wealth that they had and the things that they had and the that he was to bring her back and she agreed to come and to be uh, the bride for Isaac. We see as Eliezer brings the um, the bride back, brings Rebecca back, that Isaac is meditating in the field at evening time and he welcomes the bride and they are married. Later after they've been married 20 years, they Isaac prays for his wife to be able to have children and she does have children and so this family that started out in prayer and in service to God turns it seems um, away from God it turn they turn to their own working instead of the working of God Instead of depending on God, they're depending on themselves. The first thing that we see is a what I call a sensual father. In the few verses I read there in um, Genesis chapter 27, Isaac is doing everything he does based on his feelings. All we hear about is his feelings, his emotions, what he is sensing. We find out that he can't see. He wants Isaac to go get him some of that savory meat that he loves, his taste. It's something Isaac has decided to do, to bless Esau instead of Jacob. You remember God had already told Rebecca. They prayed and for her to have children. She had children, and she said, hey, what's happening? Why am I this way? And God said, there's two sons. There's two nations. There's two peoples that you're going to give birth to. And they're going to struggle not only in your womb, but also when they are men and when they are peoples and when they are nations. They will struggle, but God said specifically, the older will serve the younger. The younger is the one that God was going to use to carry out the promise that he had made to Abraham. Isaac was operating solely, really on his feelings, on doing it his way. It talks about his taste in verse 4 and verse 9 and verse 25 when Isaac comes in with the uh, with the stew the uh, I always think of it uh, just in the my Shelby translation uh, the country fried steak that he brought in to Isaac he brought it into his father it tasted like deer, but it was really uh, one of the goats. His touch, how am I going to tell that it's Esau? I can't see Esau. I can't see. I can't distinguish who it is, but let me touch you. Let me see if you feel like I, uh, Esau, but it was really Jacob. He depended on his touch. He depended on his taste. He depended on his hearing. Well, you sound like Jacob, he would say. And I didn't read that part of the story. Rebecca heard what was going on. And, uh, well, let's talk about that a little farther down. Jacob came in to trick his father. And he, he saw, uh, Isaac said, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. In fact, you even smell like Esau. And so we see this father who was acting on his senses, what he could taste, what little bit he could see, what he could hear, what he could smell, what he could touch, what he could taste. Unfortunately, that's the way too often as Christians we operate. 
that way. We base our faith, we base our reactions on what we can see, what we can taste, what we can touch, what we can hear. And that's not what we're called to do. This dysfunctional family began with a sensual father doing it the way that it felt right. Secondly, there was a scheming mother, and this is the part that I didn't read. Rebecca is now not the beauty from Mesopotamia that we saw Eliezer go after, but she is the scheming wife at the door, eavesdropping on what's going on. She is listening to what uh, Isaac and Esau are talking about. She also, later on in this chapter, either overheard Esau telling somebody else, but she found out some way that Esau was planning on killing his brother. Instead of her and Isaac talking, they are, or she is, scheming behind his back. She made a plan to really undo the plan of her husband and really to humiliate him and embarrass him so she could have what she wanted. That's not what we're supposed to do as people of God. James tells us in his epistle, who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation or a good lifestyle, his works with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envyings and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. There was certainly confusion in Isaac's family. But the wisdom that is from above, James says, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Remember last time we saw that Isaac was a man of peace and he, he was willing to keep moving to have peace rather than to have his own way. Now his wife is tricking him. She convinced her son really to disobey his father, to trick his father. They didn't talk about the fact that it was wrong. They talked about the fact of what they would do if they got caught. Jacob says, well, what, what's going to happen? He's going to know I'm not Esau. Rebecca said, you let me take the blame for it. Not is this right or wrong, but if something does go wrong, I'll take the blame for it. Even though their plan worked, she eventually will suffer for her scheming. When we lie and scheme, we're like the devil, Jesus said to the Pharisees. They said, we have Moses from our father. Jesus said, you're not like, you're not like Moses. You're like your father, the devil, because he was a liar from the beginning, and he is the father of of lies. So in this dysfunctional family, we have a, a sensual father who lived by his feelings, a scheming mother who would say, well, the end justifies the means. Thirdly, we have a supplanting son. That's what Jacob Jacob's name means, to take somebody else's place. And that's what Jacob had done even though God had promised that he was the promised son. He was the one that the promise would go through. 
the covenant of Abraham would go through Jacob, not through Esau, and yet he's trying to manipulate the system, trying to get something that he already has. God had already promised the blessing to him. Dr. J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary, calls him a, a pious fraud. We have people like that today who appear to be religious, and they even act religious. They act pious. They act as though they're concerned about the things of God, yet the things that they do are totally opposite from the things of God. They, well, they claim to have prayed about things that it's, God said it's all right for me to do this. When the Bible says it's not all right for you to do that. Well, I'm not happy and God wants me to be happy. God doesn't want you to be happy. God wants you to be holy. God wants us to do his will, to follow him, not because he's trying to punish us, because he wants to bless us. He wants to keep us from hurting ourselves, as Jacob did and as his mother did and his father did and as Esau did. Jacob's mother says to Jacob, you go out and get one of the goats and kill it and bring it to me and I'll, in my explanation, I'll make the country fried steak like your daddy loves and I'll make it out of this goat and he won't be able to tell the difference. You can take it into him. And he said, but I'm, I'm not an outdoor man. I'm not a, I'm not a hunter. I'm, if you remember, the Bible says Jacob was a plain man and Esau was a hairy man. He must have been a hairy man. Rebecca took the skin of the baby goat that she killed to make the country fried steak and put it on Jacob's hands as on his neck so that if his father did ask to feel him, he would feel the hair and think it was the hairy, red-headed hunter, Esau. So he gets Esau's clothes. He gets the goat hide on him. He takes the dish from his mother, and he goes in to deceive his father. Jacob told at least six six lies in this episode. First, he said in verse 19, I'm Esau. Jacob said, who is this? Or Isaac said, who is this that's come in? Jacob says, it's your son, Esau. He said, the second thing he said, I'm not only Esau, but I've done what you told me to do. Lie number two, I've obeyed you, Father, and done what you asked me to do. He claimed that the the goat was venison. What did you bring? Here's this venison like you like, this deer meat like you like. And it was actually uh, one of the uh, goat from their flock. And then he even brings God into his life. Isaac said, well, Esau, I know you're a pretty good hunter, but how did you go and kill a deer and get it dressed and get back and get it fixed so quick? And Jacob says, God helped me to get it quicker because he knew you wanted it. He even really blasphemes God in his lies. Then in verse 25, he claims to be Esau again, and then maybe the ultimate lie. Isaac says, well, come here, son, and, and kiss me. And Jacob betrays his father with a kiss. Like Judas, Luke tells us in his gospel in Luke 22, 48, that Judas came and He'd made a deal with the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. The one whom I kiss will be Jesus. 
And Jesus said, Do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Too often we focus on with movies like the uh, that Mel Gibson made about the crucifixion, the passion of the Christ. We focus on the physical abuse of the soldiers and the physical torment and torture of the cross. But think of the torment of, as the Bible prophesied, the friend who dipped in the dish with me raised up his heel against me. I think the kiss of Judas burned the cheek of Jesus as much as the slaps of the soldiers. Jacob lied. He lived up, unfortunately, to his name. He was a supplanting son. And then fourthly, we have a sorrowful son. Jacob, as the story goes, just barely missed Esau. He had just tricked his father. Uh, Jacob had blessed, uh, um, Isaac had blessed Jacob really with the blessing of uh, Abraham and told him he would be a blessing. Jacob had just got gone when Esau comes in. Esau comes in and says, okay, I'm here. The Bible says in verse 33 that Isaac trembled exceedingly. He said, who are you? Esau says, I'm your son, Esau. And he said, no, Esau has already been here. I've already eaten. I've already blessed him. The Bible says that Esau was sorrowful. Isaac had tried to really thwart the plans of God. God had said Jacob would be the one that got the blessing. And Jacob tried to, Isaac tried to bless Esau. But we can't bless what God has already said he hated. The Bible says that Esau was sorrowful. He says, isn't, didn't you name him right? When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry. And he said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. Esau cried tears of sorrow, but not tears of repentance. He had sold his birthright, and he had regretted it, and then despised it. He despised the things of God, and when he sold his birthright, he really forfeited the blessing as well. And Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob because he's tricked me, he supplanted me these two times now. It's Jacob's fault, Esau said, really. It's somebody else's fault, it's not my fault when Esau had despised the things of God. Esau, like a lot of us today, try to find someone else to blame when we choose not to receive Christ. James tells us again in chapter 1, Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. We sin because of us. We don't follow Christ because of us. It's not Jacob's fault that Esau refused the things of God. And it's not anybody else's fault if you refuse the things of God. Jesus told Nicodemus that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. 
because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than evil, not because it's somebody else's fault, but because their deeds are evil. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds might be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Esau didn't find the blessing for the same reason Adrian Rogers used to say, as a police, as a thief can't find a policeman. He was not looking for it. He was looking for the blessing, but not the blesser. He was sorrowful because he was, or he wasn't sorrowful because he wasn't in a right relationship with God. He was sorry because he didn't get the blessing. He didn't get the physical benefit. The writer of Hebrews warns us lest we should do the same thing. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. That we don't recognize it, that we don't take it, that we don't receive it. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Don't base your relationship with the Lord on what somebody else does. Trust him. Isaac, in this dysfunctional family, Isaac tried to save his son Esau, and he wound up losing them both. Abraham, on the other hand, his father, was willing to give his son to God, to sacrifice his son to God, to offer his son to God, believing that God would give him back, that God would raise him from the dead. Isaac tried to keep his son, and he lost him. Abraham gave his son to God, and he kept him. Rebekah tried to save her son, Jacob, and lost him. Because after this episode, Esau, who was very angry, Esau, who was this man of the field, this hunter of the field, he said, Daddy's almost dead, and I'm going to bide my time until he does die, and once he does die, then Jake, me and you's going to settle this thing, and I'm going to get you. And so Rebecca, under the guise again, of getting a wife for Jacob, told her husband, we need to send Jacob back to my brother Laban's house and let him marry somebody there because I don't want him to marry one of these Canaanite women. And she sent her son away. She said, go for a few days and I'll call you back when Esau's temper has subsided. But he never got that call. He never saw his, or she never saw him again. Jacob tried to please his mother, but displeased God, and he likewise never saw her again. Esau sought the blessing, but not the blesser, and he became bitter and despised the things of God. We can't undo the things of God. We can't go around the plan he has. We can miss out on the blessing by our disobedience. We can ruin our family, our faith, and our fortune. God's plan and God's purpose will be accomplished. It's just a matter of whether we are willing to be obedient and be a part 
of it. Jesus said it this way. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The way to have a dysfunctional family and a dysfunctional faith is to do it your way. To do it the way you want to do it instead of seeing how God wants to do it and doing it his way. The way to have light and life is to do it Jesus' way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The only way that we can have peace with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have to come his way. Through him, we have to receive him. We have to deny ourselves, Jesus said. Take up our cross and follow him. If we're willing to lose our life, Christ will save us. If we try to hold on to our life, if we try to do it our way, like Esau did, we'll lose it. And, and even as Isaac and Rebecca did, they, they were trying to save their children for themselves and lost them, at least earthly speaking. Use this as a warning. Don't do it your way. Seek the Lord. Trust in Him. Lean on Him. We must come His way and not our way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Thank you for those who are listening tonight. We pray that you would bless them. Lord, if there's one that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray today that they would say yes to you to lose their life in surrendering it to you, that they might gain eternal life that we begin to enjoy now as we know you. Speak to our hearts tonight, dear Lord, through your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.